Oh, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Somebody say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You know, David talks about how good it is to go up together with the believers, with the saints, with the righteous. How many here are righteous? Come on, that's it. We're righteous by faith in the finished work of the cross of Jesus Christ. How good it is to go up together to the house of the Lord and praise him and praise him. You know, there's more, there's more here than we realize. There's so much more here that God wants us to understand about his glory and about the power that is living within us as we worship him. And I don't know how. I'm just going to ask God for grace because he's been downloading revelation to me for the last couple months. And I just seem to feel inadequate and not to be able to communicate it into words. And I'm so longing to because if somehow I could just unplug a USB and plug it in and download how good he is, we would all be undone. We would all be undone. And when we understand how free he wants us. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, let's go there in our Bible. Second Corinthians 3, and let's start in, we'll start in verse... Seven. So Paul is contrasting the law in the Old Testament and the liberty that we have in the New Testament. <clears throat> and he calls the law the ministry of death. Actually, we'll go back to verse 4. And we have such trust through Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. And you know, focusing on your weakness and your constraints is actually a form of pride. Insecurity is actually a form of pride. And the reason is, is because I'm the focus. And what I don't have, and what I lack, and what's been done to me, and the mistakes that I've made, and how unfair it all is, and how bad it all is, and it pretty much sucks and it's never going to get any better. And this attitude of focusing on ourselves, even in the sense of putting ourselves down, condemning ourselves, condemning our, our circumstances, our prospects for the future, this attitude actually has at its root pride. Because it was never supposed to be about us. Like Brian was saying, like that short preview that we watched, God wants us selfless. And Jesus is the model. He came and demonstrated that. He says, I do nothing of myself, but what I see the Father do, I do, and what I hear the Father say, I say. So <clears throat> Paul's basically saying here, verse 5, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything is being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. So whether it's your sufficiency, like I got this, or your insecurity, I don't got this, it's still about I, Right? <laughs> And God doesn't want it to be about us focusing on our weaknesses or our strengths. It says, God, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but spirit, for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. And that's speaking about the difference between obeying out of a heart of love and a legalistic mindset, which says, no, you got to do it perfectly. I can speak to this because I used to struggle with being a perfectionist. God has delivered me. I used to be OCD. Actually, it was CDO because it needs to be in alphabetical order. Right? So. <laughs> and then the Lord spoke to me one time and he said, the purpose of order is the production of life, not order. And you were here the past week. You would have heard me share some analogies on that, even like an egg how it's just a temporary order, and it's beautiful, and it's very symmetrical, and 
uniform in color and shape, but it's not the lasting thing. The life that is inside is far more important to God, but it's not symmetrical and beautiful. It's a nice bug-eyed little squawking thing that comes out and screams for food. Permission to be that bug-eyed little squawking thing that comes out of your shell and screams for food. Permission granted. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. But if the ministry of death, written and engraved on stones, referencing the Ten Commandments, was glorious. What God did in the Old Testament with Israel when he revealed himself to them was glorious. I mean, it was terrifying. Flashes of lightning and thunder, Scripture says, and, and, and and a trumpet that just got louder and louder and louder. I don't think they had earplugs back then. They probably just put their fingers in their ears. And it says, and a voice that spoke to them, so much so that they begged that no further word would be spoken to them. And Moses comes down from the mountain and his face is shining. It says, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance. I want us to think about that for a second. It says that they could not look steadily at his face. What else can you not look steadily at? The sun. Come on, think about that. Moses' face looked like the sun. People were like, yeah, yeah, Moses' face was glowing. We thought, we, we think like maybe an incandescent bulb down on dim. We're like, yeah, maybe there was a little bit of a sheen there. His face looked like the sun. And they're like, whoa, whoa, oh, I can't even look at him. No wonder they were scared. If I got up here and all of a sudden my face turned into the sun, you guys would be freaked out. I'd be freaked out because of watching the look on your face, and I'd probably run the other direction too. And the Bible says that that glory is less than what God has given us. But because we can't see it, we don't live like it's real. Honestly. Like, guys, I really need to talk about the elephant in the room this morning. I really, I don't, ah, man, I hope you didn't come here today just because you come on Sundays. And if you did, I hope that you somehow reposture yourself to go, I'm willing to hear God, you say something to me other than what I already believe. Do you know that most people go to church to hear the pastor tell them what they already believe? Yeah, yeah, what he said. That's, that's what I believe. But if you only come to hear somebody say what you already believe, then how are you going to be changed? And I'm obsessed with reality. And Jesus is reality. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And I want to submit to you today that so much of how we live is not really in line with heaven. On earth as it is in heaven. What do you think you're going to look like in heaven? Let's talk about that. Let's keep going here. Um, because of the glory verse here, but if the ministry of death written and engraved on stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away? How will the ministry of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, not be even more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation had glory... The ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. Say much. Much Much more in glory. Not a little bit more in glory. The, The ministry of the righteousness of Christ in you. You have been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He's not looking at you like, okay, well, I decided to get a little bit lax with you because Jesus died on the cross. He now sees you in Christ. He sees you righteous in the same way he sees Christ righteous. It's not like, well, we're just a little bit better. Jesus is now not ashamed to call us his brothers. You get to be a brother of God. Ah, oh, mind blown. For even what was made glorious back in the Old Testament had no glory in this respect Because of the glory that excels. In other words, that glory is not worthy of being compared with the glory that we have now been given. For if what was a passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. Do you get a sense that he's repeating himself here? When God does this, it's because he's like, no, 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 you're not getting it. It's much, much more glorious. 
Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. Unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. It was too much for them. And he put a veil over his face. But even that was passing away. It was temporary. <coughs> but listen, it says in verse 14, But their minds were blinded. For until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. Way too many of us see ourselves through a lens and through a filter, and it's not Christ. It's your upbringing. It's your parenting, how you were, how you were raised as a child. It's the culture that you've grown up in. It's the traumas that you've experienced and the mistakes that you've made. And Scripture says that we walk by faith and not by sight, but honestly, it's not true. That's what we're supposed to do, but most of us, most of the time, still walk by sight and by the evidence of our five senses. And when God really gets a hold of us and changes us, we're going to be undone. We're going to be unglued. We're going to be unstoppable. Because we're not trying to conform to the world any longer. We're not trying to fit in. We weren't born to fit in. We were born to stand out. We were born to make a difference. Now, the beautiful thing here, because I don't want anybody coming into any kind of condemnation this morning, is what Brian was talking about. Baby steps. Baby steps. The only way you're going to leave here ticked off and condemned by this message is if you've already decided in your heart, I have no intention to change. I'm fine with the way I am. I don't care what the word says about who I am, about who God is. I'm comfortable with the status quo, and I'm fully intent on maintaining the status quo. And if that's your heart, I don't think it is anybody's heart, but if honestly, if that's your heart... Why are you here? <laughs> I mean, it's just religion. If we just come to do something, but our heart is not genuinely, truly hungering and seeking after him, then it's just dead works. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than sitting in a chicken coop will make you a chicken. <laughs> it's about real transformation. The word says that we are being changed from glory to glory. Let's get to it says, nevertheless, in verse 16, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Thank you, Jesus. There, I mean, we could just sit on that and meditate on that for a month of Sundays. When one turns to the Lord. When one turns to the Lord. So if I'm living like there's still a veil, and I'm going to specify out for you this morning what the different veils are, because there's more than one. But they all have the same effect of repressing the God who lives inside of you, of limiting Christ within you. Christ in us, the hope of glory. That's what Scripture says. But when we, when we live with a veil and when we, when we interact with others and with him with a veil over us, we shut down the glory and the glory can't be released. And interestingly enough, then, we, we can't actually become one. But if you were here last week, you remember me sharing Jesus' prayer that he's praying in John 17. And he says, Father, I... Thank you that you have given me glory and the same glory that you have given me, I give to them that they may be one. The purpose of the glory is to bring us into unity. But if you're given glory and you put a bowl over it because of veils and mindsets, then we can't become one. But let me tell you something. God is going to have one bride. Somebody said, oh, the church is in such terrible shape. And the Lord spoke to them and said, what are you talking about? The church is not in terrible shape. My church is in amazing shape. It's just that not all the people who go to a building are actually part of my church. But God's church, God's people, who are more and more each day learning to behold him. This is the primary reason we're on this planet is to behold him. And the more that we do that, the more we're being changed. And you might be married to someone who's bound and determined that they don't want to behold him. It's uncomfortable. It's weird. It's, I don't know. I'm just fine where I'm at. 
Well, in the days to come, that's going to bring a strain in your relationship. Come on, Jesus said, you can't turn around after following me. Anybody who turns around and looks back, and he said to some people, follow me, and, and these guys said, well, let me go and do this first. And Jesus said, never mind. Anyone who puts his hand to the plow and turns back is not fit for the kingdom of God. He says, compared to your love for me, your love for your earthly family needs to look like hate. Come on, Jesus' words, not mine. If any man does not hate his mother and father, he can have no part of me. And then we know that Jesus wants us to love all people. He's just saying, I need to be that much higher. I need to be that much more that you are pursuing because you didn't create your children. You didn't create yourself. Nobody chose to be born. God chose to create us. And he chose to create us for his glory, not for our pleasure. Now, in stepping into his purpose and his pattern for our lives, we are going to bring him glory, and he's going to give us pleasure beyond anything we can imagine. He says, at my right hand are pleasures evermore. And he says, I will cause you to drink from the river of my pleasures. Uh, sounds like it'll be enough. It's going to be good. It's going to be awesome pleasure. But it requires a single-mindedness in our pursuit of God. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now listen, verse 17. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Come on, say liberty. liberty. Come on, say it again. Liberty. liberty. God wants you free. God wants you free. God wants you freer. Maybe you're free to some degree. There, God wants you even freer, buddy. There's, there's room to grow. There's more to go for every single one of us. Guys, please don't settle. Please don't come to a place of going, I think I'm good. The Bible says, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Complacency and pride is death to your spiritual life. You don't ever want to come to a place of going, I'm, I'm, I'm actually okay. Because there's so much more of Jesus to be had and so much more of me for him to get. And as he gets more and more of me, his glory is released and people get impacted. There are people out there that are waiting for the light that is only going to come through you. There are people that you encounter and that you interact with in your job, in your day-to-day -day living, and those people may never see anyone else, and God has ordained from before the foundations of the world that he has placed Christ within you and a glory that is supposed to lead them to salvation. If we can only get our glory out from under the bowl. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. <clears throat> but we all, not Mike, not Brian, not Vivian, not Rick, no, we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. And then it says in verse, first verse of the next chapter, and there was no chapters when it was written, Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. We have this ministry. What ministry? The ministry of beholding. The ministry of beholding him. That's your purpose. Your purpose on this earth is to behold Jesus. And listen, when you behold him, it's going to undo you. And scripture says that the more we behold him, the more we become like him. Because we see his beauty. What is it going to be like? What are you going to be like in heaven? Well, let's think about that for a little bit. What are you going to be like in heaven? Well, I'll say you'll be a whole lot more childlike. You'll be a whole lot less inhibited. A whole lot less conscious of other people looking at you. And a whole completely overwhelmed with the consciousness of him and his beauty. It says in Revelation, when John the Beloved, so that's John, the Apostle John, who is called the disciple Jesus loved, and that was written by John. <laughs> 
but under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, so we know it's true. <laughs> he's like, he's like, I'm Jesus' favorite. <laughs> and it says that the last supper that he put his head on Jesus' chest. Like they were so close, man. They were, they were brothers, they were friends. But in the book of Revelation, when he hears a voice saying, Come up here and I will show you what must take place after this, he sees Jesus. And he says, and I, John, fell like one dead. It says that his eyes were like fire. His hair was like wool. His body was like burnished, burning bronze. Altogether supernatural. Utterly beauty, beautiful beyond words, beyond comprehension. So holy so full. This is God. We're talking about God who breathed the stars into existence in the form of a man who is so beautiful that nothing you have ever done or ever seen could remotely compare to him. And you're going to see him. Every single one of us here in this room has an appointment with God. And we will look into the eyes of fire and you can't stop that from happening. It's going to happen. And at that moment, you're going to be like, I never knew. How could I have known? You're so beautiful. You're so glorious. You're so holy. You're the only thing worth pursuing. Why did I live so numbed out and desensitized all my life? Why did I go after stupid things? Why didn't I go after you? But here's the thing. If I know that now, because I didn't grow up with TV, so I still have an imagination. I'm not saying some of you don't, but mine's really good. So when I read the words and I believe the words, I see it. And if I can see it with the eyes of faith, I feel it. I feel it in here. And if I know that I'm going to be utterly undone then when I see him, then I choose to be undone now. What are you going to look like in heaven? What are you going to be like in heaven? You're not going to be shut down. There's no timid person in heaven. Because there's no condemnation. And he's so beautiful. Do you know what your glory is? Uh, last week I talked about awake my glory out of Psalms there, 57. And it says awake my glory. It says you have, you have exchanged sackcloth and ashes. You have given me beauty. You have set my feet a dancing to the end or for the purpose that my glory may sing to you and not be silent. God has set us free so that our glory can be released and revealed. Let me tell you something. After the worship this morning, I know that there's another layer of glory in these walls. Your glory, and we talked about that last, last week, about how matter remembers sight and sound. It remembers and all the quantum physics and all the stuff behind that. So every moment of every day, I have an opportunity. And nothing, nothing is more exciting to me now because of what God is doing on the inside of me. Nothing's more exciting to me than coming here to church and worshiping God with you. I used to do fishing. I used to do skiing. I used to do a bunch of disc golf. And I still don't mind it once in a while. Not so much the fishing and the skiing. But I love, you know, I was really passionate about the disc golf. But now, honestly, you know what? I'm getting to a place where when I gather together with other believers and we worship Jesus, I just get so lost in the beauty of who he is. And I have so much faith to know that it's not wasted time. When we're worshiping Jesus and beholding him, there is literally glory that is flashing out from our being. And it's impacting the spiritual atmosphere in this place, in the people who come into here, in the city and in the nation. Things are changing when we worship. We're singing the song. When we praise you, it just demolishes darkness. It, or is it just words? It's just a nice beat up there and some words, and you're just doing Christian karaoke. Or do we believe the words that we're singing? And if we really believe the words that we're singing, then how does that look in our physical body and our manifestations? How does it look? Because Scripture is really clear. Scripture says, shout to the Lord all the earth. How many are part of the earth? Just checking, just checking, see if we've got any aliens here. <laughs> Scripture says, dance before him. Scripture says, lift up holy hands. Scripture says, sing to him with a loud voice. 
Scripture says, bow down before him. I'm going to be putting together a team, and I mentioned it last week. And You know, initially, I'm just going to, I'm going to hand select the people. But then as time goes by, I'm going to enlarge it. And it's going to be called the AC team. And it stands for Atmosphere Changers. Because any meeting that I go into where we're going to worship God and seek him is going to be better because I'm there. And that's not pride. It should be better if you're there. Because the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is dwelling in your mortal body. Why wouldn't it be better? God is showing up inside of you. And when you have the revelation that when you praise him, darkness flees, then you understand I'm an atmosphere changer. Anywhere I go, I bring the kingdom. Well, what is the kingdom? What is on earth as it is in heaven? Well, up there in heaven, they just worship. I'm not saying that there's not other stuff that goes on, but we're we're like, all we're going to do is worship. Look, you're not sitting on a cloud eating Philadelphia cream cheese strumming a harp. That's not what's going to go on in heaven. The throne room is not a boring place. It says that there's a crystal sea like glass and the throne of God and 24 elders around it and living creatures with eyes everywhere inside and out, under the arm, everywhere eyes. And and they're just saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was. And they're probably saying it with a thundering voice. And there's flashes of lightning and thunder. And there's there's, this noise and this swirl of color. And and it's, it's just unimaginable. I'm sorry, but Silver City just can't compete with the throne room of God. It's not a boring place. And these angels are there. And they keep saying, holy, holy. Because every time they do, they get a fresh revelation of how awesome and worthy of worship he is. It's the most electric, exciting place in the universe. And when we get to heaven, we're going to have not the obligation, but the privilege of worshiping him. We're going to have the privilege of worshiping him. And in that place, we're going to be free to do everything that he says in his word about how we're supposed to worship him. Would you agree with me? Does that make sense to you? That if he tells us in his word, shout, dance, sing, praise... And it's going to be down here on earth we do those things. But when we get up into heaven, we're just going to stand there with arms folded, leaning against the wall. What's up, God? No, we're going to be even more undone. So, Sharice, come on up. Um, Pastor Frank Wall, who is the dean of the Bible school in this church. Amazing man of God for many, many years. And he passed away here just a month or so ago, and in his old age, he was 90, right, 90 or 91, and in his old age, he moved kind of slow, because he's 90 or 91, had some hip problems and different stuff like that, loved God, but was definitely feeble in body, and so after he passed, a number of people within our community and also with uh, Watchman John Lowndes, who uh, one of the leaders there from Watchman, had visions or pictures of Pastor Frank in heaven. And one of them was his granddaughter, Sharice. Sharice, can you just share with us what you saw? I've always known him to have a limp, so I don't know if that was old age or even before that. A limp. Yeah. So just to add to that. So this is a text I sent my mom the evening after, like, he found out he passed. I said, after you told me about Grandpa yesterday... Saw a picture of him and grandma in heaven, and they were younger and hugging each other. They were hugging so close, it looked like they were crying because you could see them sort of shaking from the back. But then I saw closer, and I saw they were laughing, not crying. It looked like happy crying, but it was actually just straight laughing, really close. And then he did a spinning jump in the air, which isn't exactly his personality, (laughs) because he was so happy. And the saying, you know, whooping it up, it was like a whoop. (laughs) So, like... I don't, it's kind of an old-fashioned word, but the closest thing, I, I've seen Cliff do some during dancing yes. at the church. <laughs> yes. So that's what he did. Yes, awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And Frank is doing that. I remember Charlie Robinson, who uh, used to be an elder in this church, and he had a vision. And in the vision, he saw the parade of nations, just like they do in the Olympics. And he saw the different nations would come in, in heaven, and they would parade before God you know, um, as the nation of Africa or Canada or Russia or whatever. And he says, when the Canadians came out, he says, they were the craziest. 
He said they were, they were probably, he, there was another guy who used to be here who was wild and crazy. He danced kind of like dirt dances. But he said they were all dancing like that. They were so crazy, and, and he saw bubbles on their head. And he's like, what is that? And I think the angel told him, he says, that's everlasting joy. And he's like, well, really? Like, what is that? And scripture says, in the New Testament, it says, and everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. <laughs> And it was like these bubbles. Listen, heaven is going to be f- crazy fun. And the more childlike you become, the, m- the easier the transition is going to be. <laughs> so what are some of the veils? You know that it says in Scripture, make his praise glorious. So I want to I gently challenge you and say, is there glory coming off me in worship? Is there glory that other people can see and feel? Or am I too much aware of the people and nowhere near enough aware of Jesus? And you know, it's, it, it's okay because I think there's room for, for growth with all of us. Just be willing to take baby steps. Just be willing to take baby steps. This past week, uh, the Lord was just really impressing upon me attachment it's what we call love. Scientists call it attachment. There's a whole field of study called attachment theory. And um, what we call love, which is really kind of nebulous because we use the word love for lots of different things. You know, we say, I, you know, I love skiing or I love pizza or, you know, or I love, I love my spouse. What, like pizza or like skiing? Or, I love this movie. I love this song. Okay, well, yeah, but that, there's a lot. We're using that word for a lot of different things. And science will tell us this, that love, especially in the way that the world understands it, simply means this, the desire to maintain proximity with. So if we're saying I love this music, what we mean is I want to be close to this music. I want to hear it again. I want to have it around me all the time. I love pizza. I, I really like it, and I would like to be close to pizza. So close, I'm going to put it right inside me. And when we say, I love my spouse or I love my child, what we, want, what we mean is, I don't want to be separated from them. I want to be with them. I want to spend time with them. So in the same way, when we say we love God, but we don't spend time with him, God's kind of calling us spade to spade. He says, these people draw near me with their words, but not with their hearts. So spending time with Jesus, looking at him, beholding, reading in his word, seeking him, causes Jesus to become our primary attachment. In other words, the main thing that we're focused on, and science will tell you this, that children automatically grow up with the core values of their primary attachment. So parents in God's system are supposed to be the primary attachment. Parents are supposed to remain the primary attachment of youth until they become mature adults. How many know that's not happening in our culture? In fact, it hasn't been happening since the Industrial Revolution when they started public schooling and they took a whole bunch of kids away from the farm and away from the home and they put them all together in a classroom. And they said, we're going to teach you all the same because they needed a moldable populace. They needed a workforce that they could teach all the same things so they'd have all the same attitudes so they could control them. And when they did that, culture and core values stopped being passed down hierarchically from parent to child to grandchild. And culture began to be transmitted horizontally through eras. The 20s, the 30s, the 40s. Because the era that we grew up in and the kids we hang, that we hung around with determined our core values and our expressions. And instead of culture being rich and deep and, 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 and a, a legacy being passed down, now culture began to be defined as what kind of jeans do you wear? Skinny jeans or flared jeans? How do you do your hair? And it became very shallow. Culture became very shallow. And what happened is kids were taken out of that safe environment where the parents are spending time with the kids and raising the kids, and they got put with other kids, but they're still needing love. And so they're spending more time with one another, so they begin to attach to one another. And the only problem with that is that children are immature, not evil, just not yet fully formed. So what does that mean? It means that their love is so conditional, not because they're bad, but because they haven't, until you hit 25, your brain is still wet cement. 
you're not physically at a place to be mature enough to love other people who aren't making you feel good. Because that's what the world means when they say, you know, I love you. I like the way you make me feel. Better keep making me feel good. And if you stop making me feel good, oh, I was, I, the magic is gone. We fell out of love. So children attach to one another, but because they're all insecure, today you're cool because you're wearing the right clothes, and tomorrow you wore the wrong clothes, or you said something stupid in a group, and now you're whack, and, you're, and all of a sudden kids become so fractured on the inside. But in our culture, we've all grown up very much within this culture, and so we're so attached to one another. In fact, we're, listen to me, we're not actually attached to one another. We're attached to what we think one another think about us. And so much of our life is spent living, our, our brain is consumed with managing the perspectives of how are people seeing me right now. And the only problem with that is that we're never free to actually just look inside and let God show us who he had in mind when he made us. We don't even know ourselves because we're just play acting for the world. And we don't do stuff because, well, the world wouldn't think that was cool. And we don't say stuff or behave certain ways in church, even though the Bible instructs us to do that because we're so aware. Well, what will people think of me? And if, listen, I'm okay with being in a prayer meeting and saying nothing. There's times we've had prayer meetings in this church where the holy presence of God comes into the room and there's a hush and you can't say anything. It is so holy in there. It's just, just I feel the presence of God and I don't dare say anything because it's just like, what could I even say? He's here already. So I'm free, listen to me, I'm free to be silent in a prayer meeting. Are you free to shout? Are you free to dance? Are you free to look foolish? King David looked foolish. Are you free to step out and release the gifts God's placed inside of you, the words of knowledge? Are you free to shine a light? We're singing, shine a light, shine a light. Are you free to be utterly undone, to get on your knees and weep because you're so overwhelmed with his goodness? Now, I know that inside, a lot of you guys are going, no, I'm not. And that's okay. That's okay. Just don't stay that way. Say, well, how do I, how do I move into something else? Just ask him. Just ask him. God, I want to be the me that you had in mind when you made me. God, set me free from play acting for people. Set me free from constantly in my brain managing what is this person going to think of me. And I can't do that. Even though it says in your word, shout to the Lord all the earth. We're all part of the earth. There's so much about how scripture says we're supposed to worship him. And there's what we know we're going to be doing in heaven. And then there's this huge disconnect between how we interact with him now. But what I'm saying is, is that God is pouring out his spirit. And many and more and more are beginning to awaken to the beauty of Jesus. And they're forgetting themselves in their love for him. And as they're doing that, they're releasing their glory which Jesus gave us so that we could become one. And that group of people, as we move to the end of the age and the return of Jesus Christ, is more and more going to become one. Across the nominational boundaries, across generational boundaries, ac across ethnic boundaries, and different things, God is beginning to gather the beholders. I'm not so concerned with whether you are a believer. I'm asking you today whether or you are a beholder. Are you someone beholding the Lamb? John said to all those who were gathered, Behold the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world, who takes away your sin and my sin and every wrong thing I've ever done. And when I look at him and I think how merciful he's been to me, I get teary. I get, I get shaky on the inside because he's so good. And I just want to get together with other people who just want to worship him for how good he is who want to let their glory radiate and resonate out from them. Because as we do that, it will change the world. And you know what? God has just given a class A perfect example with Kanye West. I mean, he just took a guy who was filthy, 
profane, blasphemous, arrogant, perverted. And he just touched him and changed him. And you know what Kanye West did? I believe at the Lord's direction, because God told him to start a church in Calabasas. He went and he found a hundred Christian singers. I'm talking these people worship the Lord. And he put together a choir. And now they're going into cities all across America. And they're going into prisons. And they're awakening their glory. And if you've seen any of this stuff on Facebook, even in the last few days, you see, you see them in, in prisons and you see all the inmates. They're on their knees. You know, they went into a woman's prison, they went into a men's prison, and the prisoners, hardcore prisoners, and they especially wanted the prisoners who were in for life and a long term. And they went in there, and they just worship God. That's what they do. And these prisoners broke. They're on their knees. They're weeping. They're going into towns and cities, and they just awaken their glory, and they come in and they shift, and they change the atmosphere in those cities, and thousands are coming to Christ. Thousands are coming to Christ. And we have this mindset like, God, please come down from heaven. And he's saying, I did. I'm living in you. We're not praying to try and get him to come down. He wants out. He wants out. And what is the veils? What are the veils? Let's get into the veils here in the last few minutes. Jesus needs to be our primary attachment. Because when Jesus is our primary attachment, not our idea of what people think of us, when Jesus is our primary attachment, then we have his values. And his values are love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, and self-control. Against these things there is no law. And wherever we go, we bring the kingdom. On earth as it is in heaven. Wherever we go, we bring the kingdom. And we behave like we know we will behave then. And we do it by faith. And that pleases his, him even more. We're just singing. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Even when I can't see it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. And we know that he's worthy of the worship. Maybe you came in today, you had a bad week. He's still worthy. Maybe you've sick in body. He's still worthy. Maybe you had a fight with your wife or your kids or a coworker. He's still worthy. So a lot of times we praise God based on how do I feel. Which means we're just as carnal as the world. Because the world does what they do if they feel like doing it. And so they go to clubs and everything like that because they feel like doing that. And so when we come to church and we go, meh, not feeling it today. We're just as carnal as them. But I'm set free from that. I'm set free from even worrying about myself because I don't care what mistakes I made in the week. I don't care who hurt me. Jesus is still worthy. And so I'm going to come into this place and I'm going to praise and worship him and shift the atmosphere in my life, in my home, in my car, on the street. Because Christ inside of me is the hope of glory. And Christ inside of you is the hope of glory. So the veils. Many believers still behold him through a veil. First veil is a veil of religion. When I grew up, grew up as part of a Baptist missionary organization overseas, you weren't allowed to clap. Couldn't raise your hands and drums were of the devil. A lot of you grew up, and I'm, listen, I'm talking from the oldest to the youngest. A lot of you grew up in an environment where there was no liberty. And now that environment is gone, but you're still bound just like the elephant. They take a little baby elephant and they tie it with a chain to a deep stake driven into the ground. And the little elephant learns, I can't get away from this thing. And it pulls and it, of course it can't break the chain. And as it grows older and older, they switch the chain to a smaller one and then finally to a rope and finally to a string. And you have some, I don't know how many thousands, how many tons of elephant there tied to a little tiny twig banged into the ground with a string. And it won't leave because it's learned, I'm not free. And some of you grew up under religion, and you learned, I can't do that. And now the religion's gone, but you're still bound up on the inside, which is why you can't worship him. And Jesus says this morning, I want to take away the veil. I want to take away the veil of religion. You're not under that. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. The Lord is the spirit. And where he is, there is liberty. You have freedom to praise and worship him. God's not up there going, you better not clap. You better not dance. He commands us to do these things in Scripture. And to shout and make a loud noise to him. Another veil, and this is probably one of the biggest, is the veil of the fear of man. 
And the Bible says that the fear of man is a snare. It traps us. The concern about what other people are thinking and how they are watching. But listen, I want you to know that you are never alone. I used to tell guys when I was working with them trying to get free of porn and stuff, I would tell them, man, listen, you're never alone. You think you're alone doing that stuff. You're not alone. Scripture says that we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Every single one of us has an angel, and we have Jesus living on the inside, and then we're doing stuff. <laughs> and everybody's watching. The spiritual realm is watching. Nothing is hidden. There is no secrets. It says what is done in secret will be shouted from the rooftops. So you know what I want to do? I don't want to have a secret life of sin. I want a secret life of righteousness because one day God will shout that from the rooftops. So the fear of man, the concern with what are people thinking about me. You know what? Just ask him this morning. Say, Lord, set me free from the fear of man. Come on, if you want more freedom, just say, God, take away the veil of religion out of my life. Deliver me from those mindsets that I grew up under that limit my expression of joy and worship. I hear about Frank up there flipping and doing cartwheels and different stuff, in just so happy and so free. And if we know that he's that way, not, right now he's up there doing that, then what does that inform about how we can behave in his presence? A veil of the fear of man, a veil of man-pleasing, trying to please man. You know, I love you guys, but I ain't trying to please you. I'm trying to love you and speak the truth to you, but at the end of the day, if I know that God's happy with me, I don't really care what anybody else thinks. It says that the joy of the Lord is your strength, and we think that means God goes, here, have some of my joy. What if it actually means that when God is joyful looking over you, you're never stronger? You're never stronger than when you know that God is rejoicing over your life. If I know that God's like, that's my boy in whom I'm well pleased, I don't care if the whole world wants to kill me, God thinks I'm cool. God loves me and he's happy over me. And so coming to a place where we're not trying to please men, we're not concerned with whether they think we're cool or, or, or put together or we got it all together. I actually watched some of you, uh, Tamara here and, and others this morning, getting undone in his presence. There's a holy jealousy that comes inside me. It goes, God, I, I, I want to be more undone because I know that that's reality. None of us are going to be in his presence and be okay. None of us are going to be in his presence to be all, like, dignified and put together. When we see him, we are going to be undone. A veil of familiarity. Some of you have a veil of familiarity. You've been coming to church for a long time, and it's just kind of same old, same old. You know, oh, yeah, this is what we do. I come on a Sunday. We have some worship, you know, a couple of fast songs and three slow, uh, three slow songs. You ever wonder why we do it that way? Because it's in Scripture. It says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Praise is different than worship. Praise changes the atmosphere and praise brings the victory and then worship brings the glory. But there's a protocol to how you approach him. And he's like, when you approach me, praise me and give thanks to me. Which is why we, we and it gets our body moving when we begin to praise and worship him. And there's a process by which we become more and more focused on him and his goodness. Finish up with the last couple here. A veil of familiarity. Lord, take away the familiar, that I would not be familiar with your presence, that in the sense of, of lacking reverence, lacking awe. A veil of apathy, lethargy, and complacency. And that's just a flat-out lie. Like what he said to the, the church of Laodicea. He said, I know your works. You're neither hot nor cold. Because you're lukewarm, I'm about to spew you out of my mouth. But come, buy from me gold refined in the fire. What if we all came in here saying, I'm going to change atmosphere in here today. And I'm not the only one. I got a whole bunch of brothers and sisters. I got my fam, got my squad. But we are going to change atmosphere in this place today. And I take a burden to do that. I'm not coming just to spectate, just to receive, just to be in the atmosphere. I'm actually coming to add, not just to consume, but to contribute. A veil of unbelief. This is a big one, too. We read the Bible, and we mentally assent to what it says, but we don't believe it. So, well, yeah, I believe it. No, no, no. You, what you believe is what you're doing. So if you read, shout to the Lord all the earth, but you don't shout, you don't believe it. It's right there. Shout to the Lord all the earth. You're part of the earth, and it's a command, not a suggestion. 
And if you don't shout, you don't believe it. And that's okay. Don't get condemned. Just repent and say, Lord, take out of my heart, especially when it comes to worship, the veil of unbelief. Take away from me unbelief. Let me read your word and say, be it unto me according to your word. I will obey and I'll step into this. A veil of judgment. Listen, if you're offended at God, if you're angry at God because something didn't go right in your life, you're going to have a really hard time worshiping him. Maybe you won't even know why. You're just, there's just, uh, there's this thing there. But if you ask him, he'll show you. Maybe something happened to you in your life and it's caused you to question God's goodness and his faithfulness. That's always going to be impediment to you worshiping him with abandon because you don't really trust him. And you need to repent of judging him. Remember Job? God creates this whole process and, you know, brings Job up in front of Satan. Goes, what about him? And Satan's like, rah, 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 rah. God's like, okay, go ahead. Test him. So God does this whole thing. And then, you know, Job starts complaining and stuff. And when God shows up on the scene, he's not like, hey, Job, I'm sorry. I probably shouldn't have done that. <laughs> He's God. He gets to do whatever he wants. I don't judge him. You don't judge him. Our, our concepts of mercy and, and love and compassion come from him. We're not more merciful than he is. We're not more compassionate than he is. I don't judge him. And if something happens in my life and I don't understand, I just come humbly and go, Lord, I ask that you would help me understand. But while I'm waiting for the clarification, I'm going to praise you. I'm going to worship you even when I don't understand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. A veil of judgment, judging God. We need a restoration of the fear of the Lord. We need to cry out to God for a restoration and a resensitization of our sanctified imagination so that we can see what the word says about him. We become so desensitized by familiarity, lack of obedience, and unbelief. Glory is what comes off of us when we behold Jesus without a veil. And it will change the atmosphere in here. And around here. Glory is what we look like when we behold him and worship him in the beauty of holiness. My glory is being awakened in me is just fully in love with Jesus. That's what it looks like. When you're fully in love with Jesus, you release glory. And we understand that this is who we are in heaven. This is who we are in heaven. And so we say, let it be on earth as it is in heaven. And we always tend to think of that as out there. But what if it's in this earth? We're made of mud. Just don't tell your neighbor you look like mud. <laughs> Let it be in earth as it is in heaven. So in heaven, I'm worshiping you with abandon and liberty and freedom and joy. Let it be here. Let it be here. And God says, that's right. I establish a beachhead for my glory through your life, through your temple. And when you come together, like this morning, but even more so, guys, we're just scratching the surface. And what you have to bring is not insignificant. Last analogy. Listen, when we come together, if we come together and some of us are spectating, it's like we're trying to push a vehicle, a big car or whatever. And we're all pushing this thing, which is, which is the darkness over the culture and, and the problems we face throughout the week and all of these things. And we're trying to push this car and we're trying to push it up out of the way or to wherever it's supposed to be. And when we come and we keep our glory under a bowl, it's like we jumped in the car. And now our brothers and sisters are trying to push the car with the added weight of us in it. Don't come and sit and do nothing. Push. Push because there's a nation out there that needs to see the light shine. And I tell you, last week when I said, everybody put your hands up, and I don't even remember saying that. I would asked my wife at the end of the service, I said, why did I say that? She goes, I don't know, but you said it. And she went back and showed me in the video. I, I, I had no intention to say that, but when I said it, and everybody put their hands up, and I felt like a shock wave hit me. I just felt this Faith and this glory just radiate out from the room when we all put our hands up. When we all put our hands up. When we all, with unveiled face, behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. We're being changed and transformed. Father, I thank you that you are so loving and so patient and so merciful. And you're okay with baby steps. You're okay with baby steps. And you want to encourage us to understand the treasure you've placed within us, the power and the glory when we worship you. It shakes nations. 
It brings confusion into the ranks of the enemy. And Lord, I pray that more and more we would step into the glorious liberty of the children of God. That we would be free, that you would take away from us all the veils. All the veils that inhibit our beholding of you. We want to behold you as you are. Be utterly undone in your presence. And see your glory change a nation. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. You are loved. You are treasured. And God wants us free. Awesome. Be blessed. Be released.